Hey, Tobias Churton, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Your third time, I believe. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And you you have a new book out. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what inspired you to write uh, about the, the early alchemists? Yes, the book is The First Alchemists, The Spiritual and pra Practical Origins of the Holy and Noble Art. Uh, the inspiration is the, is the gap in what I knew and the gap in what I think most people know about alchemy, uh, which is what it really was originally. I, most people have inherited a view of alchemy as something connected with uh, occult magic or um, I think the dictionary definition practically everywhere is uh, uh, that it's about transmuting lead into gold or lower metals into higher metals. And then there's a whole load of psychological stuff that's come around since Carl Jung wrote his book Psychology and Alchemy in 1943, uh, which st relates alchemical processes to subconscious imagery or un the unconscious. And um, again, he was trying to revive the notion and psychologize it that alchemy is a spiritual discipline, uh, that the real gold is the spiritual condition of the the practitioner if they successfully complete uh, the great work. And that sort of symbolic idea of alchemy has been very influential in the 20th century and, and, and 21st century. Um, in fact, uh, what I wanted to get to was uh, really what it was, and because I was never satisfied whenever I was interviewed on the subject, that people say, "What what is alchemy? What do you mean by it?" And I, I never felt secure in in my answers at all, because there's always been a nagging suspicion with me that we've got it uh, largely all wrong, and that for the last uh, seven, 1,700 years, people have been getting it wrong fundamentally. So I wanted to do some ideological archaeology dig down into the first uh, very very earliest sources mm. and what i found was enlightening but not in the way that uh, <laughs> spiritual seekers might necessarily wish for uh in the first instance but a very re much more realistic picture and a startling one so i'm very very proud of this book in particular because it, it it uncovers an unspoken truth and uh this this is a, a field that um cries out for a, a rational understanding i was yeah, i was going to say it's a good piece of historical sleuthing i've got a copy of the book here just for reference so yeah yeah i mean would you dismiss completely what the the whole the the, the grander vision of alchemy or or uh, what, uh, yeah, I'm just curious about where your position is now. No, I, I wouldn't dismiss. I wouldn't dismiss anybody's idea of alchemy, uh, whatever it is, uh, whether it's Alistair Crowley's The Golden Dawns or Carl Jung's, or uh, people who who are addicted to Glastonbury. Uh, certainly not. You can say those are stages in the ongoing development of, of alchemy. Yeah, if you like. Yeah, I mean that's how I tend to sort of think of like Jung. I mean I. I can be guilty of a, a Jungian agenda a bit, but uh, <laughs> but but I, I was deeply affected by that book. I mean, I, I you know eff, not influenced, affected, and I had like these dreams. Some of them worthy of Zosimus himself, even if I say so myself. <laughs> but uh, but very much in that thing, it did affect. I mean, it did stir up something, and they were like you know. It did really stir something up for me, and which it would retain Wimby. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah well, but I've, I've never thought, however, and this is a very important thing, I never thought it was the final word or the only word or the only perspective. I sort of see Jung's work as like, this was an important stage, and yeah. then uh, it kept people, it, it was something abandoned and dismissed, which Jung himself said, and then it actually brought it, re it sort of re engaged living people, real people, with the kind of the themes. And it brought them back to life again, and it, they've sort of continued in some way or another. Yes. Well, uh, you are clearly confused on the subject from what I've just heard, and I was okay. as confused as you are uh, when I when I in the past, 
And the aim of this book was to remove this confusion, to take the fog away, to 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 clarify. And uh, that's what that's what the book does. Mm. And um, the thing about Jung was he he misunderstood what he was reading uh, nine times out of ten, and probably more than that. Um, he he tended to take any alchemical text from any era and put them on the same level of of his own symbology. So it was bad history for a start. The other thing is he thought that Zosimus, who is the most prolific early writer on alchemy, um, he thought he was describing his dreams in the dream passages uh, that that have come down to us. Uh, Famous dream uh, passages because they chime in with a lot of hermetic imagery through the ages. But uh, Zosimus was in fact using a, a, a well-known convention, literary convention of his time, to put certain ideas as though in a dream. And uh, Jung merely, I'd say merely, frankly, observed that uh, when you start to write dream Im- images, we, we end up in a kind of world that we all share, which is, uh, 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 you know, the, the mystifications of the, of the unconscious. I, d- I don't deny that uh, Jung found something very significant in his conception of the self-regulating psyche and the unconscious as a means to healing of the soul. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, and that he used alchemy, well, why not? Um, but he, he he wasn't writing about what the <laughs> his sources were writing about. And that that's the key the key thing that, that needs to be cleared up. We've got to clear up first of all what this word alchemy is, because it's had the unfortunate effect of separating um, the origins of the, of this practice from its original meaning. In fact, the word alchemy only appears in the uh, seventh and eighth centuries in Arabic works, which are extraordinarily late, and they're in translations of Greek works, works in Greek from before them. And alchimia, which is the, 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 the Arabic, al just means the, kimia is the key word. Uh, it's a transliteration of the Greek kumia or kimia. And obviously, we all know, is the origin of our word chemistry. And in fact, it's not only the origin of our word chemistry, that's exactly what it is. It's chemistry. And when we think about the early, quote, alchemists, they didn't consider themselves alchemists. They they were practicing the noble art of what we would translate as chemistry. Now, what's this chemia and kumia, there are variant spellings, mean? The best uh, explanation that uh, I've been able to um, uh, discern is, I mean, the usual one you'll find in many books, including mine, is that the word, the kum part, uh, may come from the Egyptian word for the black land, the fertilized, uh, the fertile soil of Egypt, the kemet, uh, the black, and that's had the connotation of the black art. I think the best Root, the Semitic root of the word kum, which you find from Mesopotamia right through into uh, Palestine, Egypt, um, is that the kum refers to roasting or heat in general. It, uh, making black is to apply heat, carb- to carbonize. The, the best translation of kimia is the art of heat, as every school boy and school girl knows, when you do your first chemistry lessons, what have you got in front of you? You've got a Bunsen burner, you turn on the gas, light it, and because of that, you can then start to learn about chemistry. And that's exactly what it is. It's about how heat uh, affects substances and how substances generate their own forms of heat in evaporation and distillation. And that's 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 the essence of it. It's the art of heat. Uh, Extend that to the materials used, and we're talking about metallurgical chemistry and the origin and substance. And I wouldn't, I'd say not just the origin, the actual substantial meaning of the text is they're describing industrial processes. These, it was an industry we're talking what I, what I found was evidence for a, a small, although at the time highly significant, industrial revolution was going on in Upper Egypt uh, around the what the area called the Thebaid, 
which is the site of ancient Thebes, and related to Alexandria. And one city in particular is important there, which is the, the Greek Roman city of Panopolis, which interestingly is the city of Pan, the all, mm. which of course is an important uh, conception in, in the history of alchemy. And it is what Panopolis was famous for then and what it is still famous for in Egypt, and it's now called Akmim, uh, is text, the textile industry. And I believe that the proper setting of the developed alchemy of the first to the third centuries, common era, AD, Christian era, that those first three centuries, what we're looking at is a, is a perfecting of the decorator's art for textiles, for making statuettes and uh, decorative and, and expensive objects. It was a lucrative trade. And the whole business about making gold is that when they talk about the yellowing and the whitening, they're talking about making uh, dyes to make the thing look gold or make it look silver. Or indeed, as Sir Simon says, why stop at gold and silver? People obsess over this. He says, our business is to make many, many colors. And purple it's, in particular is, a, is like... Uh, the, purple the most, was important you know, because it got a high price because you had to be noble to wear it. it was a, I think you could be fined or imprisoned in certain periods of the Roman, late Roman Empire for wearing purple if you were not of noble birth. Uh, but I dare say some people like wearing noble because it made them look like they were of noble birth and they get a reaction. So it was uh, a, the purple dye... To, to, most of the purple dye was produced from, from an aquatic creature whose name I've forgotten, uh, which was very rare, which gave the purple dye its reputation because of yeah. its rarity. What they were able to do in, in Egypt was to uh, reproduce a, a, a very impressive and workable purple. And that would have been a very, very, very lucrative trade. So we, we're talking about an industrial revolution that's based on an amazing discovery, which to my surprise, came much later than one might imagine, which is glass blowing. Mm. I don't know when you think, if you ask somebody in a pub quiz, when did glass blowing come about? It'd be interesting to see what the answers are. Now, the interesting thing there is uh, the first known blown glass was found in Jerusalem in the, and it dates from the first century BC. So, time of Herod the Great, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, that period, late Ptolemaic Egypt. And uh, it's, the, it's the appearance of glass that I think leads to the revolution in, in processes, which were led by uh, some very notable women, mm -hmm. and one particular a Jewish woman, uh, known historically as subsequently as Maria the Prophetess, mm -hmm. because she said she was guided by God into her development of chemical apparatus. And uh, she introduced uh, a whole range of distillation and evaporation processes. And here is where we get to the original symbolism. Here is where the spirit of the thing is, because you've got to, when you realize that this distillation apparatus, you have the heat, you have your substance, it evaporates, it goes up towards an alembic or a kerotarkis, as they were called at the top, and manifests as something different. Here is where your symbology is really all about. If you care to think of the ascension of Jesus as described in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, what do we have is the uh, a cloud removes him from their sight and he rises to his in doctrinal terms, the right hand of God. He is, and this process of the disappearance of the body, as she calls, she calls the uh, tin, copper, uh, uh, and gold, the, the, they, they are the bodies, as opposed to what she calls the incorporeals, a word related to spirits. So you have this idea of the body and the spirit and that they can be combined or separated. And she says we must join the male, which is the body, to the female, which is the spirit or the incorporeal, meaning not body, literally. And when you get the right reaction between the incorporeal 
and the body, then we're in business. Then, of course, you become it becomes something practically invisible and which rises. And the invisible rising is has immediate connotations for the the, the imagination to consider the process and the elevation of the soul. And it is in contemplating that process that Zosimus sees as a reflection of God's way with the universe. So for him, while he's a very, very practical, hard-headed chem- metallurgical chemist, he also believes that this art uh, ref- is a reflection of God's I- internal wisdom reflected in the natural processes and man's potential part in it. And this is where the thing acquires this, uh, this metallurgical chemistry acquires this huge symbolic value. You're not only uh, decorating a statue or making jewelry, and which you, uh, the art included making rubies or stones dyed like rubies or stones dyed like emeralds or stones looking like diamonds or pearls that were not pearls, but they no one could tell the difference. Uh, you get the idea of the, the transmutation. But the idea that we have of transmutation was not their idea at all. The Greek word that is used in the earliest uh, alchemical texts is extrophe, which means literally to turn inside out. Um, now, anyone who's familiar with the Gnostic tradition will um, should recognize the notion uh, from the from the Gospel of Thomas and and other uh, Gnostic texts. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So there is a very close relationship indeed between Gnostic symbology and the practice of alchemy, which is one of the great themes that I explore also in the book and why alchemy becomes part of the hermetic tradition and a vehicle for transmitting Gnostic ideas. And in fact, it's the Gnostic ideas that really take over uh, in Western alchemy, um, even though the, the Arab period, the, the great Arab interest in alchemy, which is the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, uh, the Arab um, chemists were very, very interested in the practical manufacture of acids and alkalis and, uh, and uh, uh, antimony and, and so forth. Um, they, they were practical chemists, in, in other words. Um, so it launched, really, this, this art launches chemistry, and at the same time, it, it seems to be a large part of the launch of Gnostic symbolism as well. And it may come, when I think my book is absorbed, and uh, who knows how long that will take, <laughs> because it, it won't be on the uh, reading list, I'm sure, of, 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 of many places for quite a while. Um, it may have to be discovered posthumously like uh, many other ancient texts. Who knows? <laughs> but um, some, some fell on stony ground. And some fell on the waistcoat, <laughs> as John Lennon. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so w- getting down to the roots uh, of, this, of this art has been hugely enlightening, both on, the, on a realistic, practical, rational level, it's suddenly I feel the subject is now grounded. It's not theoretical. It's not hazy anymore, and it's not confusing the planes. Uh, I also enjoyed reading Jung's uh, Psychology and Alchemy, but at the end of it, I was confused by the planes. He confuses the material plane, the spiritual plane, and his own psychological plane, and he talks in this multi-level language which people think, I'm not clever enough to understand this genius. No, you're wrong. Jung wasn't clever enough to write about it intelligently because he didn't understand what he was reading most of the time. That's why he imposed an interpretation on it. Sorry, you Jungians. How dare Toby (laughs) Churton challenge the great guru? Well, Um, I mean, mean, yeah. But but Jung himself was challenging. Jung himself was challenging the scientific uh, hegemony of his time, which was that alchemy was complete superstitious, useless rubbish, and had been jettisoned while real chemical science took off. And I, I admire Jung for challenging that 
view. And of course, also there's some useful symbolism in it. But unfortunately, this Jungian tendency has uh, has clouded our historical uh, picture, and it, it it needs to be put in its place as one approach to a symbolic system. Yeah, that's how, that's actually. I mean, that is how I tend to view it. I mean, to be fair, be it, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here a bit. I mean, uh, one of the things I remember picking up from it uh, here's Jung's take. I mean, if if it's not a dream and it's like a vision, it, or it's like a an act, he's using the active imagination. He would say, well, that's essentially the same thing. He's he's drawing off some, you know, his his own deeper sort of consciousness. Is it in that respect? And also um, the the world view, you know, the uh, we have this very this idea, very strict idea of like is the external, the internal, and then the idea was less, it was more fuzzy at fuzzy edges. And um, and in the, his when he's describing these processes, the the chem, like the copper man and so on, they are personified. So the, the very fact that they are represented as human figures shows there's like a human projection onto them. Actually, he says, uh, you know, I was filled with terror at it. I was like, you know, this person was chopped up and melted on the rest of it, and I was filled with terror. Well, he's empathising. He's empathising with in a very human way. Yes, but he's he's not, as I say, he's not really grasped what. In fact, he he thinks Osimus wrote this stuff in a way almost by accident. He he makes the criticism that these people were experiencing unconscious events, but were projecting them onto uh, chemical events. In other words, they didn't really know what they were doing. Well, I, I totally uh, disagree. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, I agree. He, uh, yeah, Osimus yeah. knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. It was Jung that didn't have a clue about what the alchemists were doing. Yeah, I reject. I yeah, I, I, I we're yeah, we're in a total accord there. Yeah, I, I, the, the uh, definitely they were doing real experiments and being you know and observing in the real world and so on. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they weren't but, projecting. They were. They were. These. Were, these were practical people looking to make better yeah. diet. Yeah. And it, it, until we see that that's the practice, uh, the other the other dimensions of it uh, will always interfere and be and cloud the issue. We are uh, as for, always, Mr. Churton. We are as always in a, of an accord. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a flat chord? Is this a flat chord, a minor chord, or well, a major chord? We, well, we will, shall we, we will uh, you know, the, the harmonious. It shall be harmonious. Of course it is. Of course it is. One thing yeah. that um, is interesting, we're talking about how the kind of, um, the what alchemy is, has been kind of distorted or grown upon over the years. Um, one of the great examples of that would be the Kybalion, um, which seems to... That seems to be a big distortion that's had a big influence, though, doesn't it? Uh, could you talk a bit about the Kybalion? I assume you've um, looked at that. It's not mentioned in the book, I, was, uh, I noticed. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't. I, I've got it. My only feeling about the Kybalion is, is, is it sounds like an Arabic text. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, and it's got a very different view. Well, it's a distorted view of hermeticism as well. So it's kind of your um, version of hermeticism in this book is the classical, I guess, version of hermeticism, and the Kabbalion's version seems to be more of a. It seems to be one that's picked up by occultists rather than historians. Let's put it that way. <laughs> if its source is occultism, then uh, that's probably why the, the book doesn't uh, shout out to me as, as a, a reliable source. Well, it's, it also seems to it seems to be part of the new thought movement as well. So ah! uh, yeah, yeah, so there's... No uh, such thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been thought before. <laughs> so I'm interested, um, obviously, for the listeners, what are the oldest texts to mention? I mean, obviously, they don't mention alchemy as the word, but as the process. Where, where, where do we sort of find these early earliest writings on the on the subject? The, the, the key texts here are what were once called the four books of Democritus. And Democritus didn't write them. He's, he, he's a fifth century Greek philosopher, um, famous for his idea of the atom. William Blake refers to the atoms of Democritus. But it was thought that Democritus uh, was one of the authorities in, uh, in transmitting this um, angelic 
uh, bad angelic knowledge, bad angels, not bad knowledge. Um, and so his name was attached to a group of texts which were written, we best believe, in the first century, around the time of Jesus and Paul and, and all of that, and which our earliest copies date from around 300. And they are the papyri. There are two sets of papyri. Uh, one is called the Leiden or Leiden papyri, the other the Stockholm Papyri, and that's simply because the libraries of Stockholm and Leiden, the Dutch city, competed to get hold of Anastasiu's uh, discovery. Anastasiu was a was a, a middleman, very important middleman, with very good relations with with the Ottoman authorities in Cairo, and he imported uh, artifacts and uh, Egypt Egyptian artifacts and papyri into Europe. And these two texts were, were found, he says, again, in, in the Thebaid, um, in the area of Thebes, you know. Um, but we can never be absolutely sure because very often uh, the provenance of these, these manuscripts was uh, invented by the thieves themselves. What they, thieves, they usually were grave robbed. That's usually where this stuff came from. And what they tended to do was they, once they knew there was a price for this material, they'd divide up a whole codex, if it was a codex, or tear up parts of papyri and sell them separately. So you actually have different parts of this material appearing in other collections. Yeah. Um, and in fact, they nearly all the material we've got of, of the magic, what are called the magical papyri and the, uh, the, the chemical papyri may well have been one library. I'll, I'll go into that in the book when, when and how they were written. But the, these are very important. These give us uh, uh, over a hundred recipes uh, for dye, dye making uh, of every kind, and they're completely practical. There's no, uh, there's no, pre a couple of minor elements that could be seen as symbolic, but in fact they're all. You take this much of that, and you take several drachmas of tin, and you, you take some of that electrum, and you take some cinnabar, and you take some sulfur, and you do this, and you do it for that long, and you put it in an iron container for so long, and you get the heat, and so on. They're absolutely practical, uh, and their word is recipe, which is interesting when you consider the amount of women who, who dominated the development of, of this art, yeah, which is not entirely surprising if you once you've related it to textiles. Yeah, I was struck by that. We were talking earlier about you know how much this early chemistry was involved. Uh, you know, lots of uh, notable women uh, like you mentioned the um, Maria, the, the Maria prophetess. the prophetess. Yeah, mm. Bambari. That comes from you know, which is with us still now. I mean, they it's like, still I use the Bambari. Yeah, yeah. That's... I think they had like hot ashes instead of. We don't use that now, obviously, but it, as part of it, I don't know. Yeah, um, that's to keep the sort of the, the temperature the same in a in a container. In, in, so. in two separate uh, containers, yeah. Yeah. Well, so she's the, those are used in lots of big, special big, you know, kitchens where they're, they're producing lots of food. You know, you know, in schools and places like that, aren't they? So but it's in, interesting sort of... as well in the fact that obviously females of the time didn't tend to be taken particularly uh, seriously, did they, <laughs> around those times? Um, so, well, oh, this is, this maybe is, I'm wrong. This, this, if I may say, is an assumption. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't see much uh, evidence historically for women not being taken seriously mm. uh, in this period at all. Uh, Cleopatra is a fairly obvious candidate for someone who was taken pretty seriously. Yeah, true, true. The, the dictator of Rome. <laughs> Uh, uh, married her and, and regarded his future as dependent on his relationship with her. Um, uh, Mark Antony also. <laughs> so I, I okay because she's really well known. Um, but if you think about the role of uh, women in Egyptian uh, thought at the time uh, and their role in ritual, uh, it's the Jewish view of women that is um, of this period, which might have coloured uh, what we think, because we have the letters of St. Paul 
make it very clear that the man is the head and the, the woman shouldn't should be moderate, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all been compounded with later views that women belong in the home and this sort of thing. Um, but uh, there were noble women who were highly influential. Um, the most intriguing part of the Zos- Zos- I should say, for those who don't know, Zosimus of Panopolis is, as I say, wrote, wrote the most copious uh, alchemical writings. And the juicier parts of his writings are letters to a lady he calls Theo Sabaya, mm. that being a uh, name. And he always, there's always a, a hint of um, slight sarcasm. He says, uh, hail, my, hail, noble lady. And then he'll say, oh, woman. <laughs> <laughs> he wants her to live up to the ideal of his ideal of a noble lady, but she keeps behaving like a woman in his view. And being a woman means she's susceptible to influence. So I don't think, We've got obviously we're not talking about inequality here, but there's certainly a greater complementarity between the male and the female, um, um, which Zosimus recognizes, and he's very concerned that Theosabaya is getting into bad ways, listening to Egyptian temple priests, um, listening to a virgin alchemist called Paphnutia, who he says she, he, these people don't know what they're talking about, um, and he explains also how the Egyptian priesthood perverted the original art of alchemy. And that is really fascinating to hear a fourth century Egyptian uh, tear strips off the great tradition of, of uh, the we, we would like to recognize of Egyptian temple knowledge. Um, and because historically it's always been the case that when we talk about Egyptian or Greco-Egyptian alchemy, we're talking about furnaces being attached to temples. Uh, and this is, I think, really distorted the picture and f- obscured what I think is the, the truth, which is that with the Romans taking over Egypt in 30 BC, with the death of Mark Antony and the arrival of Octavian and the installation of a Roman system, the art moves out of the control of the priesthood. And by Sir Simus's time, which is 300 years later, uh, it's, it's independent or, uh, yeah, in, it's an independent industrial trade with its own secrets. And Theo Sabaya is, um, her name means God-fearer, by the way, which is also interesting. Uh, was she a convert to the Jewish faith? Because converts to Judaism were called God-fearers um, in, at the time of St. Paul. So it's, it's, it, it's a, this whole relationship of what the religion was, what they believed, so Simus has a most extraordinarily syncretistic religion, which he has absolute faith in. Um, and it's a spiritual religion for sure. It r- reveres Hermes Trismegistus as, as the great sage, but he also appears to revere Jesus. He also appears to uh, revere the, the masterminds of the Greek um, uh, tradition as well, and and indeed he's he's open minded to all genius. So it's, it, this is a classic cosmopolitan brain we're talking yeah. here. Yeah, he sees no and conflict he, of interest. Very, yeah, he, it's so Simus is the most underrated class late antique figure in my opinion. There there was a good study of him written by Garth Fowden uh, back in the eighties. And uh, Shannon Grimes has written very well on him, but I think she uh, mis- misunderstands his relationship. This is my opinion. She misunderstands his relationship to the Egyptian priesthood. She sees him as somebody who is somehow midway between Egyptian priesthood or a, a kind of outlier or somebody who operated in an Egyptian temple system, but sometimes uh, perhaps gave talks to guilds. Uh, again, I think this is all cloudy stuff. It's inability to let go of an old image mm. um, and which which mm. I think needs to be done so that we recognize um, the uniqueness of this chemistry and and its historical power and why serious historians and historians of science should be seriously interested in it mm. Let's, yeah. look, let's look a bit more about um, Zymus he's an interesting character and there's some contention as to his sort of nationality even, isn't there? Uh, could you um, yeah, tell us a bit about the man? Any doubt, I don't think there's any doubt about his nas- oh, okay. na- 
nationality. His name Zosimus mm. uh, is, is, of course, is 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 a Greek word. It means the survivor. Mm. Uh, well, but then well, Greek Greek was the lingua franca of, of Egypt at the time. When he refers to our people and our race, he's clearly referring to Egypt, Egyptians. Mm. Um, but, of course, by then, by, by 300 AD, uh, Egypt was a pretty polyglottinous, if that's right, polyglottal place. Um, with, uh, there have been many Jews living there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um and uh, there were there were many Greeks living in in Egypt too. So he could he may have come from a mixed Greek Egyptian background, but he regards himself fundamentally as as an Egyptian, and that comes out in little phrases he uses when he talks about our art, and he's quite clearly referring to Egypt. So um, he he's a syncre- syncretic Greco Egyptian. Uh, I don't know whether you could call him a genius. I think. Genius, insofar as he's original and unique at the time, then then we might well uh, think of him as a genius because he synthesized uh, his spiritual system with a practical and indeed profitable trade. And it takes genius to do that, I think. Mm. And the fact that his works have survived and even though misunderstood for hundreds of years um, – that also says something about his durability, and he really is the survivor. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I hope I've managed to get him right out of the uh, quicksand and, and put him square on his feet back on planet Earth. He, um, a lot of his work seems to be kind of instructional to a particular person. Theo um, Yeah, so can we talk a bit about that kind of relationship or that kind of uh, instruction, I suppose? Yes, I think it's it's interesting. Um one one scholar, uh, Dufault, if I remember correctly, uh, has s- said that he's a ki- it's a kind of artist client noble relationship, i.e., that he was one of these sort of scholars who were employed by a noble lady um, or man as as a kind of house scholar, uh, and he's written on that. I, I think this is completely to misunderstand uh, his position. And also his attitude to the Sabaya is, is not that of somebody who's employed by, uh, by, a, by a, a mistress or noble woman. Also, uh, the, he, the, the argument went that he, he attends a banquet given by Theosabaya, which is sort of a, a nice symposium-like platonic image of the scholar turning up at the, the rich man's house as a kind of or as an intellectual ornament. But in fact, his account of going to Thea Sabaya's place uh, talks about what he found in her kitchen. And he found some cook steaming a chicken. And he says, says to her, well, that was an interesting thing. I've never thought, perhaps we could use this steaming process that I saw your cook doing. Uh, we could apply that to the art, of, uh, the art of our chemistry here. And But what's interesting is instead of going home and starting to experiment with steam, he immediately looks for a book to find out whether steam is mentioned in the book, and, and it, which, it, which just gives that feeling that while he was probably would experiment – in the sense of trying something new, his aim was not like that of a modern chemist, scientist, which is that everything had to be experimented. He, he's totally practical. It's, will this work? And for him, if it had been written about before by an ancient authority, um, that gave the process its authority. First of all, it had to be ri- written about by somebody he respected. It had to be written about by Democritus, as he saw it, or Ostanes, who's an important Persian name, uh, who allegedly came to um, Egypt and, and taught the priests uh, uh, the Persian alchemy uh, sometime after the 4th century um, BC, or BCE, as they say today. Mm-hmm. Um uh, that of that ancient authority for him is the authority, and he says if you follow these ancient authorities, you will produce great practical results. So, but it's the ancient authority first. That's obviously different to, even though I think in many respects he's a proto scientist. His attitude is the world is a natural continuum. He does not believe 
uh, that you should have to placate demons who were thought to be behind all natural processes in this period. And he's very strong on that. And his writing on that, I think, is, is, is actually revolutionary for the time uh, because many chemists were, you, were relating their alchemical a- activities to the decans, to the demons who controlled every minute of, of, the, of the daily cycle. And he says, this is all, the, all this is, is the, the evil angels um, who brought this knowledge to the world. Uh, you are just feeding their vanity and pride and you will effectively become under their control and no longer a free person. And in that argument, he's, what, he's, one of the, he's the first Greek speaking person to write He's not the first Greek-speaking person at all. He's one of the very few Greek-speaking writers to apply the idea of the uh, fallen angels, um, the watchers of the Book of Enoch, directly to the origins of alchemy. And he he, he has no doubt that al- the chemist, the chemical art, came to earth by these rebel watchers of the described in the first part of the what we call the Book of Enoch. Kind of lusty, and, lusty angels, weren't they? They were kind of after our women, from what <laughs> exactly. And he, he even and he makes a joke at the Sabaya's ex, uh, expense because he says, "You will notice in the story that the evil angels were attracted to us by lust for women, and the women gave in." Mm. <laughs> so she, he then says, "He then says this." Egyptian priest you're listening to called Nilos. Mm. Uh, this Egyptian priest is getting to your female weakness. You you need to plug that gap, no pun intended. Uh, you need <laughs> to plug that gap in your spiritual armory. And he says you must go and rise up with the tribe of Poimenandres, which is the uh, his work, his expression for the rev- revealer figure of the first hermetic uh, tract, philosophical tractate. So... Uh, yes, this ambiguous origin of the art itself is very interesting, and the way he interprets it is also unique, absolutely unique. There's nothing, nothing like it has survived. Uh, his his willingness to embrace the Enochic story, which of course is a Jewish story, um, he seems to know an awful lot about the 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 history uh, and uh, technological and philosophical abilities of the Jews, who he respects greatly, very greatly. He thinks that they were had a purer attitude towards it than people of his own background, yeah, which is, can, again, very interesting. Has yeah, a contemporary he, me, uh, it, it, impression there. there. Yeah, amb- ambiguous, as Osama seems to be. He's ambiguous in his attitude because he doesn't wash his hands completely of the whole process. He doesn't say, you know, this is from Azizel or whatever. This is Azael, isn't it? And um, Azazel, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to have anything to do with it at all. He, he, oh, no. He, see, he, he sees the value of it and, and so on. And he does, yeah, so it, there's a kind of curious ambiguity there, actually. Well, it, it isn't if you get into his mindset um, because it, I agree that it looks it looks ambiguous because of course he's he's so uh, critical of of the way the the rebel angels have corrupted the world with with demonic power, but you got to remember he, his point was that this knowledge which the rebel angels brought came from God and is pure and is part of God's knowledge. Now it may not it should not have come perhaps by the agency of these angels who, in fact, have corrupted it. Uh, but it would have come because it's God's wisdom manifest in the creation. So he's act- in his own mind, he's co- totally consistent. He's talking about what's abusing uh, this knowledge. And he talks about what he calls unnatural tinctures. There are natural tinctures. He says, but I teach the natural tinctures, uh, meaning the natural dyes, uh, whereas these guys like Nylos and the people you, Theo Sabaya, have been listening to talk about our unnatural tinctures. And he says that the priests uh, became uh, the guardians of the unnatural tinctures. Now, this is scientific language. What he's saying is that reality, as God created it, is a continuum throughout the universe uh, and is... The, while the demons try to corrupt men's understanding of it, the universe in that sense is innocent. 
it, 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 the universe is the creation of the divine mind. Our access to it may be obscured by demonic activity, but that he said that's easy, easily dealt with because we learn through Hermes that if we transcend the zodiac, the zodiacal powers which control fate, he says the philosopher is above fate. You know, that's a very, very important idea. And he says in order to be, go beyond fate, you have to ignore all this stuff about the universe is being uh, run by the demonic agencies. He says stay in tune with the highest. This is a very, uh, I'd say this is really the kind of mentality that creates good science. And good science is what he's about, which means knowledge, the knowledge of the universe. And he doesn't teach any, any, there's nothing magical in his recommendations, which may be a disappointment to people today who are confused by magic, occultism, um, spirituality. That confusion has come through, uh, through the way the traditions have been garbled uh, after the, specifically after the 16th century, but before that as, as well, and the separation of science and spirituality. Um, so now, for example, and I'm one of them, I was sympathetic to magic because it was something that science didn't like, you know, <laughs> because growing up in the 60s and 70s, one was asphyxiated by the scientific. It seemed to have occupied every dep department of the human experience. And if you couldn't justify a thing immediately with demonstrations, then it couldn't exist. Uh, whereas, you know, there's more things in heaven and earth than I dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, that one. <laughs> so, uh, but I, th I think today we are, we, we, we are, those who are interested in hermetic philosophy and spiritual understanding of the universe are a bit prone to be overly sympathetic to the magical. Yeah. In the sen in the magical, in the demonic sense. Yeah. One um, part of the book I was kind of interested in was you, you sort of um, talk about the guild system. Mm. Um, and where would the alchemists, as we'll call them, um, of this period, where would they lie within these guild systems, do you think? Well, it, it, a lot of this is conjectural based on, on interpretation of the very limited evidence we've got. Um, but we know there were guilds. Um, there are, there are, we have records of guilds in, especially in Alexandria, a visiting Jew, one of the Tanaim visits uh, Alexandria, I think about the second century, and describes the different trade guilds, uh, many of which were run by, by the Jewish population in Alexandria. And, um, they, they, you know, they, they were also associated with the, the same community that traded together, also worshipped together. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there was a Jewish temple in Egypt uh, until um, 73 AD. I mean, a temple, I don't mean a synagogue or a church or something. There was a temple with, a, with its own priest that from the time of Anias, and the high priest Anias in the second century. So there's a very long religious association between the Jewish uh, intellectuals and Egypt. So there's quite a lot of tradition behind this. Now, talking of guilds, what is a guild? A guild is a group of people in a trade who meet, not for the betterment of the trade, but also there's usually a social side to it, often associated with, in those days, would have been with some some minor amount of religious ceremony. Now, um, were these? We don't know of any specific alchemical guild, um, but there were plenty of trades which were using, or would have been using, uh, chemistry. Um, dyers, for example. I mean, dyers in general, dyers of textiles, uh, would probably have, may have provided the furnaces. That were being used by the, uh, the the what I'd call the high end of the market, which Sosimus I think represents. I think these are, these were into the luxury luxury market. I think it was Pliny the Elder who said that uh, there are many things in the world that people value more than gold. Um, the gold is not is not the thing everybody seeks. And in those days, if for example, if you had a statue that had been blackened after it had been 
coated with either real silver or a silver dye. The black, and, for some reason, this is how fashion goes, the blackened silver was <laughs> regarded as more valuable than something that looked silver. It was just regarded as a, as a refinement. It's very interesting. Yeah. I think we're back um, to the chem idea again, aren't we? Of like the black, the uh, you know the black, the significance of the black, the darkness, the blackness. It might it might be that. I mean, it might be the influence of statues of Anubis, and they were very fashionable in Rome, and the Isiac cult, and I think Re Egyptian statuary was popular in the Roman Empire right outside of Egypt. And I, th I suspect that's where a lot of the money was coming in. I think so much money was being generated in Egypt that you have this very interesting story of Diocletian, who in the uh, fourth century, uh, third century rather, third century CE, um, according to John of Antioch, a later historian, says that he had all the books on alchemy, chemistry, burnt because he said they were making so much gold in Egypt that it was financing rebellion against Rome. <laughs> now, the story has gone, of course, people thinking, oh, these guys were making gold uh, in the sort of medieval idea that they were making gold out of something cheap. But if you read between the lines, anyone with any brains would realize that if they were making gold, Diocletian would have had all the practitioners picked up and brought to Rome and said, right, you make gold for me, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing would have pleased a Roman emperor more than the, yeah. than the idea that he'd got a bunch of people who could make gold out of tin, you know, or lead or what have, or sand or whatever it is. What it, what it means, I think, is that the, 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 there was so much loot to be made out of making uh, gold colored, I looked like gold, felt like gold, and probably many people who bought it thought it was gold and silver and ruby and emerald and all the rest of it, that they were making real gold in the sense of the gold and, sil and silver coinage. So uh, there was huge, there was more money, there was more gold money to be made out of the gold look, if you, if you see what I mean. It was, it was, uh, we're talking, I think, I think we are talking about a very profitable business. And it may be Diocletian's activities that that curtailed the trade. It, there may there may be much more to that story than meets the eye. If there was a systematic attempt to ruin the practitioners of the chemistry, that would also explain why, when in the sixth century, the, under Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor, uh, and you've got this split between the Western and the Eastern Empire at that point. When they start making the Christians of Byzantium, now Istanbul, uh, start making collections of chemical writings, at, at that point, all those those writings are being gathered by Christian monks who mm. saw in them not only uh, they thought they were reading about transmutation, i.e. literally turning one low, element, uh, low substance into a higher one, um, but that their interest in it is philosophical and religious. That's how they're seeing these texts. Now, something must have seriously happened between 300 and 500 that they couldn't see that they were reading straightforward, uh, although they were never written quite so straightforwardly as, as in some of the texts we, we got, like the Leiden and the Stockholm texts. Those are very straightforward. Um, I mean, there was a mystique about writing this because there were trade secrets, and you, you didn't necessarily you didn't want everything on paper because your your rivals would have all your ideas and all the rest of it. So there was a lot of shorthand was used, and and symbols, not religious symbols, but just symbols to divert attention from those who didn't know and divide and and so you got the drift. Um, but something must have happened to enable this change of perception of these texts. So by the 6th century, you've got Stephanus and Olympiodorus writing about chemical writings as if they were reading philosophy. Mm. You know, and it's as philosophy that they are preserved. That gives them their value. Uh, you And, and the, the same happens in the 10th century when you get the Codex Marcianus, and, uh, which were the big compendia of alchemical writings, which were the main, are, which are our absolutely main source of knowledge of these early people, um, they were trying to make alchemy into a, uh, a liberal art, 
on a level with philosophy, rhetoric, grammar, and so on. So because the interest in these writings had developed so much philosophical weight, and that you, that wants some explanation. I, I think there must have been an active uh, d- destruction of, of the industry. Mm. And, and that would chime in. Um, I mean, you, you had enormous instability in Egypt in the third century, for sure. The empire of Palmyra, uh, today Syria, uh, invaded Egypt and, and ransacked its temples and did who knows what damage. I mean, we don't have newspapers from this period. We don't know what, the, you know, we have chronicles. Uh, we, ha- we, we are far more ignorant than we are knowledgeable. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and Egypt, the, the empire of Egypt was like 3,000 years, it spanned 3,000 years, and that's a hell of a lot of history. <laughs> and, <laughs> a hell of a lot of history. And we can't, we, we haven't done that yet. Uh, you know, our, our, our civilization hasn't done that yet. So, Well, I know, I think we're getting further away from it. I mean, mm. I was talking to somebody today about, you know, William Blake, for example, his, the only period of English history he's really interested in is uh, what we we call the Middle Ages, uh, apart from his prehistorical ideas of Joseph of Arimathea and that, uh, but Shakespeare writes almost exclusively about medieval kings. One uh, image in the book that really struck me was uh, where you're talking about laboratories, and um, there's a lovely image in there of like a laboratory, but it has like a spiritual component built into the laboratory where you see the man worshiping. I'll, I'll throw it up in the screen in the edit, but the. Um, it's it's a fantastic. It's it really is a, a sort of indicator of the time where you you can see that the science and the spiritual world are less divided than they are these days. And yeah, that's the in- illustration I think from one of Daniel Mergling's books, who was a sort of um, Rosicrucian apologist, mm. uh, if I remember right. It's quite it's quite a famous engraving. Um, I think Dutch Dutch engraver, a very lovely engraving, where you have the uh, the word laboratorium. Mm. Um, and it's the, this new word because nobody knew about laboratory. Laboratory was not a word used in the ancient world um, at all. They had, I think, it was called the ergasterion, was a place of work. And uh, another writer of the 17th century invented a word for a, a sort of laboratory, but it didn't catch on. Uh, what's caught, caught caught on, in fact, is 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 very interesting seems to come out of a mis- slight misunderstanding. So in this illustration, you have a uh, labor, if I remember right, which means the work, uh, which is you, you see a fire and you see alchemical instruments, aludels and alembics and, and distillation vessels. And on the other side of this checkered room, done in wonderful Renaissance perspective, is oratorium, which is where the... As a, a, uh, looks like it could be a Bible or a map of the universe, uh, and and the practitioner, who's just left his bellows on the other side <laughs> of the room, is yeah, he's uh, like worshiping, worshiping, in front, yeah. worshiping the higher power and trying to get the inspiration and and in a way he's kind of sacrificing to this higher power in order to get the knowledge to do the oratory. This goes back to an, a, a related engraving from the same book, I think where you have the idea of Ergon and Paragon. Ergon is the man in his oratory, uh, uh, hands up to God. Paragon, below in a cave, we see the alchemical equipment. Paragon, not on Paragon, Par Ergon means a byproduct of the work. So the work is get close to God. The byproduct is you will have then success in your chemistry. Now, what would Zosimus, 1300 years before, have thought about this? Is He'd have said, you've got these two things mixed up, or rather unpro- improperly separated. There's no ergon and paragon. If you do the ergon right, you'll get the paragon. And if you do the para- your paragon right, you'll get the ergon. Mm. There, It's one process. Uh, a, a, a man of truth who embraces nature should find divine inspiration in the process, mm. you know. And there are and there are plenty of scientists uh, I've met, like David Hughes, astrophysicist at Sheffield, Fred Hoyle was another one, who found their idea of God through studying the universe. Mm. 
and I'm sure there are many people today. I was always fascinated at college. Uh, when I was at Oxford, the uh, preponderance of um, chemists who were evangelicals, but biologists were always atheists. Not always, but a very large number of evangelical Christians could study chemistry without feeling their faith was attacked. But biology, the people who studied the the mortality of the human body, etc., and it, its material constituents tended to be atheistic. Very interesting, mm. which probably says something about the nature of our medicine today. You know, it's, it's, it, I was fascinated by that. You can study chemistry as you can study astronomy and not lose faith in a higher intelligence. But look at what Blake says about the human body. Um, he talks about, wilt, wilt thou... The, the baby's smile is glorious, but would you put his limbs out like flax to dry? In other words, if you look at the body as body, it's ghastly, ghastly. And we know that if it's been dead for a short period, is a terrible smell. It, putrefaction and rottenness are written in to the, the body. Um, but of course, what would Sir Simon say again? He says, ah, you, you haven't combined your corporeals with your incorporeals where this combination manifests at a higher level as as a refined substance so how do we get from the sort of more scientific uh version of alchemy let's say the bait the, the base metal as it were <laughs> um of alchemy to this kind of more magical version this kind of it seems to happen around the Paracelsian kind of era, doesn't it? Where you start to get things like the homunculus and the kind of um, these kind of more grotesque almost. <laughs> um, well, OK, uh, a lot of I mean, it, it, the history of alchemical literature, which has been studied quite, quite intensely since the 60s, particularly, but it, the effort started before that. I mean, that's why I would never blame Jung in any serious manner, because at his, when he was writing in the 40s, there was very little to pick on uh, in terms of study. So he's a, really a pioneer. And like all pioneers, he, he may have taken a few wrong roads and misinterpreted some of the topography. But anyway, today we do have a, a, a quite a good idea of the, de the development of the, 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 the bibliographical story of alchemy. Um, I think the, the problem areas are when Greek texts were translated into Arabic um, and they're losing their specificity. They're losing their true sits im Leben, to the old German phrase, their real setting in life. They're, they're being regarded on one hand as magical uh, texts for uh, creating the elixir, al -ixir. Uh, That's the origin of our word elixir. Again, it's an Arabic word, al -ixir. Uh which is the idea that there's a sort of a medicinal a application of this knowledge. Um, and they're getting mixed with magic and they're getting mixed with people who are genuinely interested in, in chemistry as we know it. That is combining treating substances to create new, new combinations. Um, and then the Arabic material comes west, is translated into Latin in little compendia very often combined with magical writings. Mm. So we have a long, long period in the history of science when uh, magical ideas and, and purely natural processes ideas are very much intertwined uh, to the extent very often you can't tell one side from the other. So I would say that you know, to answer your question, the origins of science are bound up with the survival of magical texts. And that colours the whole field until we enter the strictly experimental era, uh, which use these phrases post Renaissance, if you like. But it's it's when you get a, a sense that, uh, but it, I mean, this is never clear cut. And some some pioneer scientists were highly religious men and mystical. Robert Boyle, uh, Isaac Newton. Um, Elias Ashmole, all contributing in their in their ways uh, to to a more modern, as we call it, idea of science. N very few of them really materialists. That for that you have to add 18th century 
David Hume um, and and the whole philosophical, sceptical movement of the late 17th uh, from John Locke onwards. You, when you get a scepticism about spiritual entities uh, altogether and then you get this it's actually probably philosophy that's causing the split more than the scientific community itself. And as I say, there's still pe lots of people in, in the scientific world for whom uh, some form of faith and or mysticism or etc. is perfectly compatible with studying. The point is, though, is while you can be a believer and a scientist, uh, you would find it hard, you'd be hard pressed today to find a chemist who um, thought that Christ was the transformative stone. Mm. Well, that's interesting you bring up the stone, because that's one yeah. thing that um, so stone. many writers, yeah, so many writers on the subject of alchemy seem to focus on the philosopher's stone. Um, and it's yeah. something we, we haven't really brought up yet. In, and it's it's almost impossible cough to... Up. Yeah. Cough yeah. Up. We should, yeah. We should cough up the stone. Isn't that yeah. famous? <laughs> yeah engraving in michael myers atalanta fugians is it is it atalanta fugians where you have uh, the figure of saturn above a mountain literally coughing up the stone yeah so what, uh, why why considering what you said about the kind of more scientific side of alchemy why is the philosopher's stone such a a thing of uh of, of focus for so many writers on the subject of alchemy would you say well, i don't know why it's a, i mean anyone can see why it's a focus because it's a it's an all-inclusive symbol mm. um here you have a substance that will uh whose agency whose projection into into a situation will transform you know, have the midas touch you know king midas touch everything he touches turns to gold the philosopher's stone is a similar idea it's its origin as I trace in the book is through a, a whole series of misunderstandings of uh, third century, first century, fourth century texts. Uh, there are mentions of stones in the, in the earliest texts, but they refer to, generally speaking, stones, <laughs> the stones you could die. Uh, some of the references to certain stones, we, we're not, totally sure what they were referring to there's a lot given to a substance called the summer stone and it seems to be uh, related to uh, a principle which is described as erotilos which i go into some detail about the origin of this word and what they were really th but the point is is the context of the use of the word stones is always dying and it is only in later commentaries you don't even get the word the philosopher's stone until the seventh century. And then when it does appear, it's certainly not the kind of uh, JK Rowling, um, Merlin-esque medieval Gothic idea of you have this powder and once you produce the powder, you add that and boom, Bob's your uncle, you're, you're a rich man. Um, it's not that at all. It, it's the, the, the philosopher's stone uh, becomes a kind of symbol of the work. But the use of the word philosopher, I think, comes from Zosimus, who's always referring to the philosopher this and the philosopher that. And he's referring to Democritus, who he also always calls the philosopher. Hmm. Uh, and that's where I'm pretty sure the combination of the word philosopher and stone comes about. There is no nothing in the early materials to suggest they were trying to produce a, 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 a substance or powder that would transform uh, lead into gold simply by projection and projection just meant to an ingredient mm -hmm. you know if you add this ingredient you know just add water you, know, <laughs> you might produce cadbury's smash but there's no you know which is quite would have been quite impressive to to as it is to a child you know it's never seen add water to a few granules and you get mashed potato i mean that sort of thing was going on in chemistry all the time you add this and that happens hmm. um but we, we don't get any serious interest in this philosopher's stone um as as a transformative agent until the arabic period after the seventh century and then it becomes mythological and then it becomes an obsession and in the middle ages it becomes an obsession for rich nobles 
uh, who I or indeed perhaps rich nobles becoming poorer from lack of gold <laughs> if they heard that these chaps some of these monks usually the monks in the middle ages who had the alchemical knowledge that they could produce gold uh, then it becomes even more important um, the, the concept becomes essential uh, in in I think with periods of warfare and poverty because there's, there's this urgent need for gold you know that's that's driving a lot of the politics isn't it as it indeed today the economy stupid you know and and its beliefs in the philosopher's stone which are equivalent to the philosopher's stone would be the national lottery you pay you pay uh, a few pence for your ticket and you rub it <laughs> <laughs> oh alibaba you know open sesame and boom boom you're a billionaire millionaire or 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 you win enough to buy a new tire for your car um that's the philosopher's stone is the is the wish fulfillment of all people of uh, lacking the acres as my dad used to call money <laughs> um and and in that sense you could say the philosopher's stone is a, a very ancient pitfall as the king midas story tells us it doesn't belong in the early chemical experiments it's 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 they are not doing that they the real the 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 best writers of the period that we have were never in, under an illusion that they'd created uh, something out of nothing. What they were delighted with was their ability to imitate nature. Mm. And I am sure there would have been practitioners, even in the early period, who probably kidded themselves. There are phrases in the four books of Democritus, i.e. in the Stockholm and, and uh, Leyden papyri, where they say this would deceive anyone. In other words, the, it, this will produce a, a silvery effect so good anyone would accept it. Well, if you're a hungry chemist, you think, uh -huh. I don't, if I do it this way, I can sell it as silver. You know, and if they say, is that silver? They say, well, well, of course it's silver. What's it look like? <laughs> there were only there were only a limited number of tests, by the way, in the ancient world of of, of gold, and one was to you know to to heat it up and see whether there were any impurities in it. But but a good chemist could get round that as well, and you could you could you could they could produce a gold looking substance that would pass a test. The kind of the metal Louis fake Louis Vuitton bags of their time, in a way. <laughs> they say, yes, yeah. yes, and I've, and I, I, I'm dare say, given what so Simus is pleased to Theo Sabaya to keep in the company of the good practitioners obviously tells us that there were a lot of bad ones mm, yeah so it, would, I, I, this, it may be that something of the order of the of a magical component was already implicit in the earliest knowledge uh, of it but uh, we just certainly don't have any record of that but I'd be very surprised if there weren't um, uh, counterfeiters yeah. who, you, who tried to use chemistry to pass off and may, may have convinced, as many people have been convinced by fool's gold, you know. Yeah, true. You've, there's a lovely chapter at the end of the book where you talk about the kind of legacy of, of, of alchemy. And I was wondering, what is, your, what is the legacy of alchemy? For, uh... It's a bit like the footersy. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the well, the inheritance is is the basic uh, notion that there exists in uh, the universe substances um, whose changes through human manipulation can be very beneficial. Uh, that, that's the first thing. Is in other words, chemistry, the greatest uh, legacy of what we call al we're calling alchemy, because that's. The, the name that's become associated with these texts um, is, is that it's, it's actually chemistry and scientific method. That's that's the paradox. Uh, whereas our encyclopedias of of yesterday would would say that uh, alchemy was a kind of decadence or uh, of something older, perhaps, or the mythological level out of which 
chemistry may have grown or grown in association with. No, I, we, we must re-establish that these people were not theoretical scientists. They weren't interested in theory. They weren't bothered about Aristotle's theory of the elements. So Simus takes Aristotle on at one point and says, he's the brightest of the unilluminated thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> to which I say, how could he be bright if he wasn't illuminated? <laughs> but what he means is he he sees the world in material in its material dimension only mm. and it, this has limited his vision reminds me of when i met gillis quispel the great gnostic scholar who brought the gospel of truth to carl jung in person at uh, basel station i think it was or zurich station i forget he told me the story anyway and he said the enlightenment was a blackout meaning it closed off the spiritual uh insight st paul says spiritual things are spiritually discerned and the physical man the man obsessed with appearances with substance uh, will never get them mm. will never be well of course to a science to a certain kind of scientist that's just red rag to a bull well if it can't be seen and it can't be uh, demonstrated to my sense experience then it cannot be it is as far as i'm concerned it cannot exist but you're entitled to believe in it Mm. that's then the patronizing attitude comes in but only a person who'd never i really understood uh, spiritual vision would say such a thing yeah i i, I counted plenty of that mm -hmm. as a student uh I, it was a for me a lot of the academic life i i experienced after school was was a blackout mm. i had to go in search it's and i'm still I i'm still refining that search i had a similar experience at my university i went to a science university as well and it there's a literal society there that its whole sole purpose was to stop any kind of spiritual groups appearing in the university so oh i can well imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the talk about this kind of like elitism that <laughs> the, the science world had there it was uh yeah, yeah. it was it was unbearable and you know at the time i was very interested in the occult and magic and so i was deeply frowned upon by this society <laughs> Gosh, you but, were. Uh, yeah. i remember meeting i remember meeting i think david wolpert uh, the writer uh, the i'd say he's a kind of activist for scientism mm. and i met him at jean gampel's salon 1987 in in um Cheney walk in in near, you know london mm. by the thames and i i was talking to gampel about medieval freemasons and he went no oh. like that you know <laughs> and i said yes you've really demonstrated david that you believe in black magic <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway i remember last time you were on you told us you were writing a book about enoch or the book of oh enoch. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah yeah is that is that the next uh, thing we can expect from you or next, next year is my magnum opus on all the books of enoch origins development reception history uh, and the origins of christianity I, I the the title at the moment working title is a three-stage cake i i wanted to call it beyond the universe mm. as the main title which is a bit star trekky for me uh, for my sort of books but i i it really is what it's about that's mm. what these people were writing about was beyond the universe and the, then the subtitle is uh, The Amazing Books of Enoch, the, or, uh, the Pioneer of Jewish Mysticism and the Origins of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And it's my probably my last word on the, on the subject of the origins of Christianity until the world catches up. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many pages is it going to be? How many pages? Yeah, well, uh, is, is it a tome? Is it like a huge... You know, I'm 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 salivating now that you. you <laughs> uh, is it a huge tome? What do you? How many pages do you consider? <laughs> I used to knock off a six hundred page book every year, um, big enough to keep the door open. You know. I tell you what, I'm I'm thinking in terms of Are quality, you not quantity. Pages or I, I I'm sure I know the quality is going to be very high. So I I <laughs> I'm being a glutton, and I'm just thinking about quantity. There will be and plenty I, I, there. 
It's I'm... a good three-course meal with, <laughs> with aperitifs and, and, and a trip to the pub afterwards. Excellent. So, Excellent. Or before it. <laughs> a, man's, a man's soul is in his stomach. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, what if the member of the band said it was an a, it's an adult dose? <laughs> don't worry about the length it 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 it, it finds like like Uroboros, he finds its own it, he finds its own length and uh it uh, I, I have to say that if you experience real publishing today commercial publishing we're much more limited now in page numbers than we were e- even three or four years ago mm. um my books now i'm to, i'm i'm strictly limited um although some leeway has been given in in the case of Enoch, because of the the, the immense coverage that the mm. book gives, I wanted to really. I mean, all I've ever really wanted to do was understand where how our religious ideas have come from and what they mean. Yeah, yeah, I'm That's, fascinated with that as well. That's a, a topic. And I think this this is to me. I, I, Normally, I've been doing a book a year because one thing either leads to another, or I suddenly realise, damn, I must do that, mm. and I try to find a way of coming up with a proposal that a publisher will will take it, take my interest in. After Enoch and after Alchemy and finishing the Crowley um, thing and and all the other stuff, William Blake and I, I honestly can't think of anything I want to write about that badly uh, to go through the agony of writing it. I'm, I'm sure yeah. you will, Mr. Chairman. No, I think I'm well, hoping you will. I'm, I'm hoping you will. I'm, I'm you know, I, 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 you, well, if you've it, got something you want me to write about, you better tell me because <laughs> I, I really am, I'm really, I'm really stuck for subject matter. I don't like minor books. I, I couldn't write about, say, Jacob Burma, you know, Jacob Beamy, as the English have called him, for example, who I think is a, a, an important figure, but very, uh, you know, needs to be sort of sorted out like the Gordian knot. But every time I've got into Yucca Burma, I realise that the complexity and the difficulty of Burma is simply that he's complex and difficult. I.e. he was not sufficiently uh, attuned to his subject to make it palatable to a later era. He fascinated people in his own time and, and for the next 150 years. But I, I had thought of doing a book on Burma is what I'm saying. Um, but I, I really can't see much point. I don't I don't think that, that the book could. I don't think Burma has the power to inspire people today that he had in the 17th century. Whereas other figures I've found in the past still work. The magic still, the tune, the tune still resonates. You know, mm. um, he's they've outlived their time. I think I I see Burma personally as very much of his time and dealing with a concept of the universe that you you would now have to explain. To such a degree that it the, it becomes a feat of memory, and I don't like I don't like subjects that are just you know I had to me- I memorize it now I understand it. If what what does the understanding give you? If that understanding leads you to a greater vista, it's worth doing the untangling. But I have I strongly feel that in the case of Burma and many other writers and writers on the tarot cards and things like this. I feel you're getting into a smaller and smaller universe. Mm. Yeah, true. For me, anyway, I, that's how I feel about it. I've, I've tended, I've tended to get deal with things which I think lead m- our generation and the generations to come will lead them to a bigger universe. Yeah, bigger well, conception. Of it. That's a great space to uh, for us to stop. Thank you so much again for that's giving my us modest some modest time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But thank you so much again for giving us some of your time. Um, um, I look forward to talking to you about email. Right. Splendid. Splendid.